She grew up in rural Indiana, the oldest of four siblings and a homecoming queen. While many of her female classmates dropped out of college to marry, she took a job at Clorox, where she helped launch Fresh Step, the only paw-activated cat litter. Fresh Step Cat Litter, and the beginning of a storied career. She went on to become the CEO of a software company, best known for its hit trivia game. You don't know Jack! And later, the first company to sell movies online. But it was the online pet store, known for its popular sock puppet Spokesdog, that catapulted her to the center of the dot-com boom, then became the poster child of the bust. As CEO of Pets.com, Julie Wainwright took the company public, then closed its doors within a year. 20 years later, she's looking for a better ending. In 2011, Wainwright launched The Real Real in an attempt to disrupt the online luxury consignment market. The company raised $300 million in a splashy public debut in June 2019, but the stock took a big hit on a report about the authenticity of its products. For this edition of Bloomberg Studio 1.0, I spent the day with Wainwright at Real Real's first retail store in downtown San Francisco, right before the global spread of the coronavirus shut down retail stores and other non-essential businesses across the Bay Area, and before the company withdrew its full-year outlook. Joining me today on Bloomberg Studio 1.0, the real, real founder and CEO, Julie Wainwright. Julie, it is so great to be here. Oh, thanks for coming. So the arc of your story is so fascinating. You took Pets.com public at the height of the dot-com boom, and then it became the poster child of the dot-com bust. Two decades later, you take the real, real public. Is there any sense of deja vu there, or is this a completely different story? Oh my goodness. Well, the times are different. So if you look at when pets.com went public, I think worldwide there were 200 million people on the internet. You had people um, really, really worried about shopping online. Look where we are now, 20 years later. Shopping online is, everyone shops online. In fact, it's, I would say for most people, it's preferred. So do you think you were just 20 years too early? Oh, absolutely. Way too early. Getting a little bigger picture, we've got the lingering trade tension between the U.S. and China. We've got the coronavirus right now, which is disrupting supply. We've got potentially gloom and doom about economic growth in the future. How does that impact your business? This business was born out of a recession. We should fare extremely well because people get more value. There's $300 billion of goods trapped in people's homes worldwide. So we have a long time here. So I think we're going to do incredibly well. Um, we're also not fad driven. We're value driven. We're environmentally driven. I think we're going to be really, really great. You know, consignment stores have been open forever, but no one's done it this way. And no one's focused on pulling the best product, describing the condition, authenticating it, offering it online, uh, you know, thousands of new products added every single day. And here we sit in our store. We have experts staffed in the store. So we'll have gemologists and watchmakers. We have stylists. And I think when you walk in and you've seen it, I saw your eyes, you walk in and it's like the store comes alive. Right, I can barely contain myself. I'm so distracted by all of these beautiful things. I, it, it's a little treacherous, <laughs> but you can rest assured, Emily, if you buy it, you can reconsign it. At the same time, you've got the Macy's and JCPenney's of the world closing. So where is retail going? Well, clearly it's restructuring. If you go into every major city, which I do, you see retail stores and department stores really struggling. Retail isn't going to go away. It has to be redefined. Now, I want to talk a little bit about where you came from. You grew up in rural Indiana, the oldest of four siblings. That's right. What wow. did you like to do? Wow. Um, well, let's see. First, um, my parents were both went to art school. Um, my father graduated. My mother didn't. She dropped out to marry my father. The big thing was when I was very young, like four and five, neighborhood plays. So what do you do? So my job in the plays, I don't think this will surprise you, I was the person who picked the play. I casted the play. I collected the money, <laughs> sold the tickets, collected the money, and other people were the actors. Then the other thing I did was I had a library. And uh, so I lent books to people, and I charged late fees. I was very strict on the late fees for some reason. We grew up in Indiana. I'm outdoors all the time. I mean, the other thing is we all had 
you know, much when you look at it now what we did, but we all had motorcycles from the age of about 10. So hang on, you were a 10 year old girl riding a mo motorcycle. Well, by the time the youngest was 10, I was older, but um, sure. Now we all rode motorcycles, um, dirt bikes. So we rode motorcycles, we had go-karts. Uh, we used to ski Michigan, which isn't, you know, which is fine if you live in Indiana, but it's not really skiing. It's mostly trying to not fall on ice. So we were out a lot. You know, you were always outside. Your mother was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis when you were young. I believe you were eight years old. How did that change life for you? Consciously or unconsciously, probably a little bit of both. I actually sort of became like, oh, I've got to step up. I was the oldest in the family. So the good news is like while daily things really bug me and I can get irritated, big things I can just roll with. It, it really does build up a grit as you know, your per, my personal capacity to um, withstand a lot of change to deal in a crisis is pretty high versus other people. I tend to get very calm um, and I'm sure it's an early childhood training. And yet you were the girl who rode motorcycles and still became homecoming queen. Well, I was also good at school. Oh, I was homecoming queen, for, like sophomore homecoming queen. I was on the student government. I graduated from high school not realizing how hard it is for women to do anything because I was felt very empowered. Were most of the women of your generation dropping out of school, getting married? They were. And, and that was, and, and it was a little was disappointing. Like? Well, I almost did it. I don't know. I probably haven't talked about it. I actually was engaged in college and um, I was going and he was a graduate student and when after he got his job I was gonna have to follow him and and I uh, used to walk the invitations I walked the invitations to the mailbox for a week I could not put him in I'm like I don't want to get married I kept thinking my life was gonna get smaller so I called off the wedding six weeks before the wedding I was like being you know I sort of it's hard to fight it's sort of hard to fight crowd thinking and certainly cultural norms. And it was a cultural norm. You took a job, you got a job at Clorox. I just kept thinking I'm so young and it's the bigger world out there. I knew I was good at um, brand management and my one professor made a call to the head of Clorox's research and said, you have to interview this person. Even though I was an undergraduate, and they were only interviewing graduates. And I didn't even give it a second thought. Packed up, left, came here. And you launched Fresh Step Cat Litter. That's with right. Perfume. That was your big break. Encapsulated <laughs> perfume. Well, I started on bleach, liquid bleach. But yes, it freshened with every step. See, I even remember. So when I was at Clorox, there was women at my level, but at the you know at the general manager level, there were no women, and the rock star women were being put in. They sort of their career path ended up in HR. I kept thinking, I'm so young, I want to take risks, and got a call and joined Software Publishing, one of the first software companies, as so, a product manager. So you became the CEO of a company called Berkeley Systems in 1994, which is best known for a game they marketed called You Don't Know Jack. And I don't want to gloss over this, because the year was 1994, and you became a CEO as a woman. What did that take? Let's be clear, it was failing. The company <laughs> was failing. So, But I don't want to minimize it either. No, 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 I turned it around. But look, I mean, at the end of the day, women did, do not get as many opportunities on really great op companies. Um, so the company was failing. Uh, the founder was tired. He didn't know what to do. I came up with a game plan. First, they promoted me to president. Then they promoted me to CEO. And we made it happen. And, and then and you kind of launched his career as a career CEO because you became CEO of another company, Real.com, the first company to sell movies online, and then came Pets.com. Right. It's easy to you know remember that it went bust and maybe it was 20 years too early, but even Jeff Bezos back then had purchased a big stake in Pets.com. And I just wonder what you learned from that whole roller coaster of an experience. It was incredibly hard on me. Um, I didn't brush it off lightly. And, you know, I learned to like get over stuff and move on because I did, I don't want to say wallow, but I would say, you know, it's sort of like I went on my own odyssey. Right. It almost took 10 years too. <laughs> you know, it, 
it was hard. It was hard on me personally, professionally. Um, my marriage broke up. You know, you got a divorce at the oh, same time. Exactly same time. But you know what? I have to tell you, if you're in a trench with someone and they're like, "I surrender," you're like, "Whoa!" You know, you don't <laughs> want to. You don't want to go to war with people like that. So look, at the, I always say, when you're when things are bad, and that then you know who your real friends are, and things get real. And in my case, they got real, real. We are the only company that works incredibly hard to keep fakes off the market. Julie Wainwright is focused on disrupting the online luxury consignment market with The Real Real, a company with over 2,300 employees, including more than 150 in-house gemologists, horologists, and brand authenticators, and about 15 million members. The company rose 45% in its first day of trading after a spectacular $300 million IPO in June 2019. But since then, there have been bumps in the road, including having to withdraw the company's outlook for the full year of 2020 as a result of the coronavirus. In 2011, you founded what became The Real Real. What was the germ of the idea that made you think this story would have a different ending? I wanted to get back into e-commerce. How do you compete with Amazon? So I had this framework, a lot of good ideas, and it was really luxury. They can't do luxury. They can't do this. They can't do beauty well. So then I'm shopping with a girlfriend. I love to shop. And uh, she, there's a little bit of consignment in the back of the store. She bought consignment. Now, this is someone who I have shopped with many times. I've never seen her walk into a consignment store. When we walk out, I'm like, what just happened? I was like, my mind was in. She was like, you just bought consignment. She goes, oh, I, who cares? I bought beautiful things at a great price. And then I said, have you ever consigned? She goes, no, have you? And I said, no. So that was it. And so I thought, this is a huge opportunity. Now you combine that with a recession, which had happened, pretty aggressive recession in 2008. People became value conscious. And by setting up a way for people to make money off their personal luxury goods, it actually changed the equation. We were telling our friends, we had this little warehouse in San Rafael, and we had visual merchandising. So meaning, we had a rack, like here's our Gucci, here's our Dior, how do we have 30 items that we can build a sale? We had a sale every third day. Instead of counting, we're like, oh, we got a rack, we can do a sale. Um, I knew right away it was gonna be a big success. You were actually renting U-Hauls, picking up consignments, Unboxing, boxing, right? Like Everything. you were doing that. I, of course I was. Who else was going to do it? <laughs> you did end up raising more than $350 million. You took the company public. Huge, very successful IPO. Tell me about that moment and what that felt like. It was actually just a fabulous day and a fabulous moment and a critical milestone for the company. Um, it raised our visibility, gave us the capital and um, I feel good about being a public company. At the high, the company has been worth two and a half billion dollars. Um, CNBC did a big investigation about authentication at the company, and they say that they found hundreds of items that were faked. What went wrong there? We are the only company that works incredibly hard to keep fakes off the market. We have great processes, incredible sophistication, a great QC team, and but it's still mostly human driven. We use AI and technology uh, mostly to get rid of uh, bad consumers and also note, you know, what happens, especially during the holidays, fakes filter in through the system. For our gemologists, they have a lot more equipment. Some of it's highly proprietary. That one is um, very, very, very sophisticated. But when you're looking at a handbag, we have people take, you know, looking inside, checking serial numbers. So do we make mistakes? Sure. Do so we make a lot of mistakes? No. In October, we processed over 420,000 items. We actually had 20 items out of those that were suspect. I want to read the statement that you put out. You said, the real real has the most rigorous authentication process in the marketplace. We are the only resale company in the world that authenticates every single item. There is no other resale company doing more to remove fakes from the market every day and put counterfeiters out of business. 
how many fake items do you catch and how many fake items do you think you miss? Well, we know in October we probably missed 20. But here's the most important thing for a consumer. You get a free return. We re-authenticate. We're not trying, I mean, our goal is to keep fakes off the market. Amazon reported in their last um, earnings, we, are, we have fakes that may hurt our business. It was stated as a risk to their business. That's not us. What we do is we try to keep them off. They're like obviously comfortable with keeping counterfeits on. That's not us. Our goal is we, we take responsibility for our platform. Yeah, so how is Amazon's approach different? I think you'd have to ask them. They come across as agnostic um, because there are counterfeits up there right now. The key for us is to really keep that trust going. We have a great customer service department. We're here to keep counterfeiters off the market. How does technology help you identify a real Chanel bag or that a piece of jewelry is truly authentic? It's easier on the jewelry because um, we have so many machines that measure alloy content, for example, uh, measure, and this is where a gemologist should be here, talking about the refraction of the colors, um, understanding the origin of the gemstone. I usually wear a lot of Cartier bracelets. We know the alloy content. We know how they cut diamonds. You can look at the bezel. We have magnifying equipment and also refraction. So we have logs of all of this. So we can go through and it's, and, and you can say in, right away, fake, fake, fake. And what about the bags? I've been to China, I've seen the markets, I've seen the fake bags. Some of the fake bags look and feel really good. I'm not gonna say it's not easy. It's, it's very, very hard. It's very hard. We have skilled people, we have a lot of data. We use scales, we use uh, black light. We have a lot of techniques that we use regularly and then all that knowledge is stored and shared. But look, it is hard. I mean, counterfeiters get smarter. We have to get smarter. The jobs have changed in our operations center and they will change, but it's also because we're automating what we can automate it to free up more time for uh, deeper authentication. I think the board should do the right thing and have governance, absolutely. And that book will be written on how SoftBank makes investments. The market value of the company went from two and a half billion to now one half billion. What do you think is next for the company that is going to turn that around? Well, look, I mean, the stock market, we have to be conscious of it. We have outside investors. But the key is, ever since we've gone public, we beat plan every single quarter. So we've done better than we said we're going to do, and we're going to keep executing. It's really as simple as that. I, my belief is the gap will, will uh, correct itself. Our brand isn't very well known. We're at about 20% awareness. Getting our brand out, satisfying our customers, the stock price will take care of itself. What's next for the real real in the next five, 10 years? So given the fact we have about less than 2% penetration of all potential consigners and buyers in the US, we have a long way to go in the US. We have huge opportunities in Europe also. So worldwide, we're gonna be a worldwide company. There's no doubt about that. We're looking for good locations for maybe 10 to 15 stores in the US total. We're at four now, so we have a ways to go there. Retail goes hand in glove. Men's is really a high growth category for us. We're underdeveloped there. So we have a long way to go there. We have a long way to go outside the US. We're just getting started. Folks like Jen Hyman, the CEO of Rent the Runway, she's made the argument that in the future our closets will be rented. We might buy a pair of jeans or a white t-shirt, but everything in our closet we will rent, like, like Netflix movies. Do you buy that? Rental has a really strong place, so I don't think everything, I mean, if you think about it, if you spend money to rent but then you own nothing, yeah. people are going to buy. I think a large portion of it will be rented. Clearly, they've done a great job, but we're going to have a place. I mean, at the end of the day, if you buy something and then you resell it, to be honest, we have people that buy and resell from us all the time. It's cheaper than renting because you're buying something that has intrinsic value that can be resold if you take care of it. What was it like pitching this idea to mostly male investors? Um, it was a zero-sum game. We had um, Matthias Schelling of eVentures that got it right away. I always say he doesn't count because he's European, <laughs> right? So he understood luxury. No other male 
actually invested in Series A, and I met with all of them. As soon as I met with a female early stage investor, they're like, don't go anywhere. We're going to do a term sheet. This is awesome. Clearly, we've talked a lot about how there are not enough women investors, not enough female entrepreneurs, not enough women getting funded. But what do you think is worse in Silicon Valley? Is it sexism or is it ageism? Oh, I don't know. They both go hand in glove. Um, so look, I, there's, there's a lot of unconscious on both sides, unconscious uh, sexism. There's blatant sexism. I actually graduated from college with only a couple professors making sexist comments, but thinking the world was mine. And then you get here and you just get stopped and stopped and stopped. So you fast forward 40, 40 years later, and we haven't made that much progress. As a person sort of at the end, you know, let's say I've got another 15 years um, really working hard and loving it. It's, it's sort of heartbreaking that um, you sort of walk out and all your innocence gets stripped. I think we have a long way to go. Well, let's talk about the age thing because this, you know, some would argue, you know, part of the problem was the prioritization or idolization of these super young male founders. You know, I wonder what you think of that. Yes, the bro culture is real. Um, I actually blame Andreessen when they had all that money. They're like, oh, founders will never get, we're never going to fire a founder. In my head, that's where it sort of clicked in, where the culture shifted. Really? My job was replacing founders. I wasn't the founder of Pets.com. I replaced the founder. I replaced the founder in, in uh, Real.com. I replaced the founder of Berkeley because boards were very active. All of a sudden, that goes away where founders are king. I mean, you've got young kids, a lot of money, a lot of of uh, irresponsible, I mean, horrific behavior. That is on the venture capital firms and they have to take a hard look at the way they're managed. They're not professionally being stewards of the businesses. So that's on them and, it's re and it is really bad. And the stories come out and you're like, I mean, how about the WeWork thing? Come on. So do you think more founders should, should be replaced? I think the board should do the right thing and have governance, absolutely. And that book will be written on how SoftBank makes investments and how they, how they govern. But it wasn't just SoftBank. Mm -hmm. But, you know, think about it. He's got this plane. He's got this. He has his ice spa in his office. I mean, what? Come on. So then what still needs to change Everything. Here? I think at the end of the day... Public companies would not accept this. Do you still feel like you face some of these behaviors or you face some of this discrimination, even though you are kind of like a unicorn in that you are a woman who succeeded when no women were succeeding in Silicon Valley? Like, oh. is it something that you still feel yourself? Um, yes, I felt it recently and it was really interesting. It was sort of unpalatable. So but you know, here's the other thing. Um, when you look at what happens, my age is in the press all the time. Fine, but do you really ask male CEOs, how old are you? Of course not. I mean, that's just crazy. But I mean, you know, at the end of the day, you can't, you got to pick your battles. And what's your advice today to women, young, old, black, white? Would you tell them to lean in? Look, um, I don't think it's about leaning in. I think it's about um, continuous learning, being curious of what you do figuring out what really where your values lie and aligning what you do with your values. I think it's critical, harder to do when you're younger. Use every opportunity to learn. And the other thing, own something. So for instance, if you say, I did this and here are the results and here's what I learned, you're so much more valuable than not owning something. Julie Rainwright, founder and CEO of The Real Real, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Emily.